severe chronic fatigue syndrome or severe myalgic encephalomyelitis. Sometimes when people get diagnosed, they hear about these stories where people end up being very severely ill and it can be quite scary. And we've got to remember that most people are not going to experience this kind of thing. But some of us, uh, including myself, uh, have experienced uh, very severe symptoms and been in a severe state. And we can wonder, how is it possible to recover? Now, if you don't have severe chronic fatigue syndrome or severe myalgic encephalomyelitis, I suggest that you skip this interview. But if it is something that you're dealing with, then this interview could be one of the most inspirational ones for you. When we are bedridden with MECFS, you can feel really helpless. You can feel unresourceful and very vulnerable. And it can be very difficult to think, how can I possibly move forward? How can I help myself? Or how can things change if there's nothing I can do? But it's interesting, there's always something we can do. Uh, in fact, even nothing is something when we do it the right way. And this wonderful interview is a great story of recovery from severe chronic fatigue syndrome with Vera. Vera shares uh, how she coped and how she took some bold steps, how she pushed through her difficulties with even being able to communicate or take information in from people, uh, whether that be audio or video uh, or seeing anyone face to face, and how she progressed and took some very big and bold steps. Vera showed an amazing amount of courage and I hope you are inspired and hope you gain some powerful insights about how to recover from severe chronic fatigue syndrome. I'm very excited to share another recovery interview. And today I'm speaking with Vera from Norway. Hi Vera, how's it going? Hi, <laughs> good, <laughs> how are you? Yeah, I'm great. It's uh, lovely, we managed to uh, connect via, via the internet, uh, I think on uh, Instagram. And yes. uh, I, you, you popped up on my uh, sphere because I noticed you were doing a lot of positive advocacy work, uh, uh, spreading the uh, positive messages uh, about um, CFS and uh, ME and your uh, personal experience um, and mm. uh, you were actually ill for a, a number of years is that right? Yeah uh, like seriously ill bed bound for three years but like the decline was maybe six years yeah six years okay yeah. or like three years before three years Six years altogether, I would say. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. okay. Um, so what? Three, uh, three years before bedbound, three years bedbound, and then three years after bedbound. No, th three years before bedbound, three years bedbound, recovered. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, <laughs> and um, so let's start at the beginning. Um, I mean, what happened? Uh, were you always healthy and fit before you started to get ill? Or did it come on slowly? Did it come on quickly? What happened? Mm. Well, I've never been like um, struggling with my health before that. But I always had like, uh, like little uh, things like a lot of exercise eczema, acne, um, I somehow, like in high school, I was always getting a lot of like tendonitis and inflammation in my muscles. So like looking back, it all makes sense because I was under a lot of stress back then as well. Mm. But my health like deteriorated to like another level in my 20s. Mm -hmm. So at 20, that was when the decline began and I began having a lot of stomach issues, digestive issues and I got diagnosed with the irritable bowel syndrome the year I started university. So it was a mess. <laughs> uh, 
and then I was just trying to survive university and just trying to function while basically not digesting anything <laughs> mm. and like that went on for like three years until I collapsed right yeah uh, three, <laughs> three years I mean when you say you weren't able to digest digest anything I mean um you know, can you tell us a little bit more about what what that was like I mean were you hungry mm. all the time were you able to eat foods what was happening uh, I I mean that I wasn't able to eat without having pain mm. so yeah that gives you like a really complicated relationship with food like I need food I am hungry but <laughs> yeah this will give me bloating and horrible pain and nausea and and, and where was the pain yeah. <laughs> uh mostly like the large intestine i would say like bloating okay. pain cramping yeah i had it was really painful to sit mm -hmm. in the classes hard to sit down so i mm -hmm. would like excuse myself and go and just stand in the bathroom and breathe mm -hmm. so yeah, it was really hard to focus. <laughs> That's not the <laughs> life of a twenty-year-old at university that we uh, that we aim for, is it? Um, yeah. So then, I mean, what had happened leading up to to that? Did anything happen uh, in, in that twelve to eighteen months before these symptoms came on? Um, I was traveling um, when my stomach really deteriorated. I was in Brazil for three months and that's where I like really started having trouble. But now looking back at it, I, I won't say that traveling caused it. I would say stress caused it. Mm -hmm. So, um, I hadn't yet come to this realization at the time, but I grew up in psychological abuse and there was so much pressure on me to achieve and to become an engineer and so I think that when I was beginning university the stress really ramped up because I was like okay this is my now I have to like do it uh, my whole life has been leading up to this so mm. it felt like life or death that I became an engineer. Mm. Well, so, why, why was there yeah. so much pressure to do that? I don't, I don't know. I think it's, it was, hmm. <laughs> that's really hard question. Like why I was fed this, <laughs> but, mm. hmm, because it, in psychological abuse, there's like, it, there's an expression called the double bind. And it means you're like put in this trap that says like, damned if you do, damned if you don't. So I was told that <laughs> um, if you don't become an engineer, you will suffer, you will starve, you'll get sick, divorced, like all the bad things that can happen to a family or a person were because of that mm. didn't have a lot of education basically. Mm. And this like <laughs> put the fear of God in me. <laughs> yeah. So I thought that if I didn't become an engineer, <clears throat> I would struggle to survive basically. But as I started university, my parents seemed displeased and like didn't want to hear about it. And if I told them some about some good results, they wouldn't, they would like get this like displeased face. So did you uh, ask yeah. them why they were showing a displeased face? No, no. no. Why, why do you no, think they were I'd, displeased? Um, I think it was because uh, they basically didn't want me to succeed. 
or to mm. surpass them in success mm. or in mm. happiness, basically, is what yeah. I've realized later. Yeah. 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 It's difficult. Uh, yeah, many parents have good intentions, but we all have our own baggage. And sometimes we're not very good at not placing that onto the next generation, hey? Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps but you see it differently. I also think some parents don't have good intentions as well. Yeah. 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 That's my experience. That's your experience. So, so it's, it's extremely confusing. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, I understand. So... So you became a uh, study, uh, you started getting irritable bowel syndrome, uh, pain, bloating. Did you have any other symptoms? Uh, yes, I was, I also, like my skin problems also worsened around the time my digestion worsened, which mm. makes a lot of sense. And also felt like a lot of brain fog, like I couldn't focus and I remember I would just read the same lines over and over again in my textbooks and it just, I couldn't, it didn't stick. Like I couldn't, couldn't understand. process it or understand. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, and I also felt hot, like hot flashes, uh, a little dizzy, not a lot, but just like this low grade dizziness. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, and like um, I wasn't like, I wasn't, didn't feel like grounded and in my body. Mm. Yeah. Did the symptoms uh, keep growing uh, and changing over those first three years before you became bed bound? Was there fatigue from the very beginning or did it just grow or how, how was that? I feel like uh, the symptoms, these symptoms that I just mentioned were pretty constant. Mm -hmm until like three years and they, it just rapidly grew worse. Mm. I would say I felt a lot more hot. I was sweating all the time, even when it was cold <laughs> and I felt more dizzy and the fatigue, I, f I feel like it came over a mm. summer, but there nothing like special happened. I think it was more like, uh, I, since I had been in this state for so long, I'd reached a new state of mm. like depletion and deterioration. Mm. Yeah. Because it's pretty tough going when you feel like that sick. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Takes it out of you, doesn't it? Um, so did you get a diagnosis then of CFS or ME uh, at any stage? Yes, but like two years into being bed bound. Wow. That's when I got the diagnosis. <laughs> so what were the doctors yeah. saying? Did they said to say all these symptoms come from irritable bowel syndrome? Uh, they weren't really saying anything actually. Um, it was more like we can't find anything. So one doctor even said like, for me, you could run a marathon tomorrow. I don't care. <laughs> it was extremely frustrating um hmm. like i felt like no one was really concerned about this 23 year old who couldn't go to university and, and couldn't walk basically hmm. and i yeah like after those first three years i got new symptoms uh very neurological symptoms so um my, uh, the examination in the healthcare system was very like neurologically focused. Mm. Uh, like I started to lose like function in my feet first. I uh, couldn't really walk, could only limp. Uh, my feet felt so weird. They felt extremely heavy and light at the same time. And when I closed my eyes, I couldn't tell where they were in space, <laughs> um, couldn't straighten my knees, couldn't like stand up straight. If I tried, I would shake. So I was walking in this like squat, limping and like squatting. Um, and after a few months, it happened in my hands as well. So like my hands were 
clenched in fists for like two years, couldn't use them. And there was a lot of pain as well, like electric shocks going up and down my nerves. So I was examined for like MS, um, like nerve tissue deterioration, all those things, but they couldn't find anything. And when they couldn't find anything, they just said, I don't know. And I, there was no help <laughs> or treatment. It was, mm. I was just left to my self, basically. It, did they yeah. then diagnose you with CFS or ME? I mean, after all that, when they ruled out the yes. other things? Yes. Right. First, first they said like post viral fatigue. And then like six months later or something, I got the CFS right. and me. And you were bed bound at this stage? Yes. So before the diagnosis, I mean, what are you thinking? I mean, you must be, what's going through your mind? I yeah. mean, that's obviously, you know, a pretty extreme experience. First, I was thinking, did I get a bug in Brazil and has it like been eating <laughs> at me for like years now or do I have this like low grade infection but they couldn't find any weird bugs or <laughs> infections so. though and then I truly believed I was going to become paralyzed mm -hmm. um, and that I had some I truly believed my nervous system was like deteriorating so, and, because and it was. I wasn't I mean, getting like, any treatment. You know, obviously it's getting worse yeah. and worse. <laughs> it's not like you're imagining it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I thought I would end up bed bound or at best in a wheelchair. And I thought I never would have like function in my hands and fingers again. Mm. And I also had like trouble moving my eyes. My eyes felt like stiff. It was hard to move them to the side. I don't know if anyone else mm -hmm. um, has experienced this. This was mm -hmm. how I felt when I was bed bound. It was, it was extreme fatigue, but it was also, I just couldn't walk. <laughs> I couldn't move. Yeah. So how do you spend it? So go ahead. Sorry. It was just like this uh, psychological torture for years. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. How do you how do you hang on mentally? How do you hang on through those times? I mean, hmm. I feel like I was. Um, you kind of dissociate. <laughs> Is that the word? <laughs> yeah, you're kind of not there. I you kind of just go away in your mind. And where do you go to? Uh, like mostly I tried to sleep and just not be awake. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it was horrible. And I like if I didn't have the internet, I don't know if I would have survived mm. because lis listening to audiobooks and like it, it my eyes hurt, so it was hard to like watch a lot of YouTube, but I listened to YouTube videos and that like kept me alive basically. And like after, escapism, I, right? Yeah, but also the things that I learned on YouTube like accumulated into my recovery. Mm -hmm. So it, it was, it started as an escape, but ended up being like a life raft mm. yeah so what yeah, kind of uh, I, like, what kind of yeah. things did you listen to um i discovered like um self-help <laughs> mm. for the first time and that really like planted seeds within me that like you can actually change your life and you can actually grow and heal and like discover yourself <laughs> and get to know yourself and 
that was like exactly what I needed. And um, I was uh, watching a lot of Lavender uh, on YouTube. Uh, she she has a lot of like journaling prompts and stuff, which is really nice. And she has a podcast, and I guess on that podcast had a story that ended up changing my life that led to me trying the treatment that ended up in my recovery. So mm. the it was like a chain of events yeah. that I'm so grateful for. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, you you can't move. You feel so sick. It's hard to cope. You're in that bed, in that room. And we can feel yeah. like we're trapped, can't we? But man, when we have that some sort of a window to the outside and and we have the yeah. power of our mind to do something even if it's a little something even if that little something yeah. doesn't even uh necessarily fix anything it can lead to something that can yes. fix something or maybe <laughs> make things just a little bit better yeah yes <laughs> and, and and i i, I sometimes yeah. talk to people about when they're in these dire situations you know we make these projections i mean like you're thinking oh okay i'm going to be never going to walk i'm never going to get my life back i'm going to be in a wheelchair or bed bound and you know all of this is conjecture it's not fact it's a possibility mm -hmm. but there's no it's not a fact and it's so yeah. important i think to to remember in these moments that what's going on through our mind is not a fact because it feels like a fact because it's happening right now but it doesn't mean that's our future is it yeah i love how no. you uh how you just just escapism and you found your life raft it's fantastic <laughs> <laughs> now what was everyone yeah. else around you saying i mean what was did you have any close friends yes um uh, i kind of lost touch with the most people at that time because I was just answering messages and stuff was just too much for me so I did go a long time with like only texting friends like twice a year <laughs> something. Mm. I was extremely isolated because <sighs> Like, I didn't want to set off any of the neurological symptoms, so I tried to, like, <laughs> um, not have as much um, notifications and input, basically. Like, mm. I wanted to be in control of your stimulus, all the noises and, yes, the stimulus. Yeah, well, everyone who's got it knows what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. We all know what you're talking about. So... And so, at this stage, obviously, you're very poorly, you're bed-bound, uh, you still got, uh, presumably, the gut symptoms, uh, you got the brain mm. fog, you've got severe fatigue, uh, and you've got the difficulty with, uh, presumably, lights and sounds, in general? Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, sound and, what, what about was smells? The worst, yeah. uh, I didn't really have a um, problem with smells. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And um, and did you have any other symptoms? Any other cardiac symptoms? Palpitations? Did you develop POTS or anything like that? Um, I don't think I have. I had POTS, but I um, like towards the end of my bed bound period, which was like the worst. I uh, lost a lot of weight, and I got the heart palpitation. Mm. Did you um? Yeah. Did you notice that certain foods were setting you off more than others? Did you try any diets? Yes, I was on the low FODMAP diet for a long time. You heard of that? Um, did did it but help? It, yeah, a little, but not fully. <laughs> mm. But it was the best thing I tried before Ayurveda which is what worked. <laughs> yes. Um, 
and I also tried the keto diet, but um, yeah, that made me very dizzy and mm. my blood sugar just went too low. <laughs> so, and, yeah. and were you living with your parents at the time? Yes. So how was that? Were they looking after you? I guess that someone must have been bringing uh, the food, right? <laughs> yeah. But I I was very careful not to ask for more than the absolute necessities. Mm. Yeah. And every time I was out of bed for like 10 minutes, my mom would start talking about what my peers were doing and how they were succeeding. And it was just, it was horrible. <laughs> And what doesn't yeah. sound like there was much understanding for what you were going through. No. <laughs> what about your dad? Yeah. No, he. I think I've only had like eye contact with him like two times in my entire life. Like he, he doesn't talk and he's in yeah. his own world. So yeah. There, yeah. there was no support or love. <laughs> Yeah. Like no chewing or no relaxing atmosphere. It was extremely. I was walking on eggshells. Yeah, extremely walking on eggshells. Yeah, it's not great. I think anyone who knows what it's like to walk on eggshells can relate to that. But I think anyone who knows what it's like to have CFSME recognizes that's like walking on eggshells on top of a volcano. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I felt like I was constantly drowning and there, everything was unstable and mm. yeah. <laughs> so we're going to talk about obviously your, your turning point and you already mentioned how uh, uh, I, I can never say the word Ayurveda. Uh, Ayurveda, uh, yes. Uh, yes, <laughs> how, it, uh, how it played a part in that. But I just want to, I want to just, before we launch into that, I want to talk a little bit about this, this whole thing about being so helpless, so vulnerable, yeah. so unsupported. And, you know, even because there's other people who are supported, they don't feel supported. Because even with the best support, it doesn't necessarily change and people don't understand what you're going through. So sometimes people are trying to be kind and it's almost worse than being left alone. Like there'd be some people who would be jealous of, of the, uh, uh, you know, of being left and, and not spoken to. Do you know what I mean? So, um, it's funny. There's, there's different types of pain out there. Um, but the point is like, it all seems so hopeless. And, you know, just take us on a journey. How do you get out of this when everything keeps getting worse, keeps getting worse, you can't take the stimulation? Mm. I mean, how do you move forward a little bit? Tell your story. You're, you're in bed. You haven't gone anywhere. You can't talk. You can't, <laughs> or, well, you can talk, but you can't yeah. have people talking to you. How yeah, do you yeah. Do exactly. <laughs> how do you get out of that? Uh well, I had to like push myself and push through some symptoms to read books and get some new input and new information. Because if you change nothing, nothing will change, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's because I tried to like rest my way out of it, but that didn't really work. Maybe it would have worked if I was in an environment where I could like truly rest which i wasn't so maybe rest works i don't know <laughs> yeah there's <laughs> a big difference between rest relax. and lying down in bed all day they're not the same thing yeah i was lying down but in constant panic mm. so um sometimes i would just get this like strong gut instinct that i need to read this book or watch this video and I just followed those instincts and mm. and what would happen afterwards? The answers. Would you pay for your efforts? 
with uh, flare-ups and worsenings? Yes, definitely. <laughs> uh, like, if I read a book, I would get a huge headache. And I maybe next day or the day after I could beat some more. So it was it was horrible, but uh, over time, these books and these videos on different subjects like accumulated into my recovery. So, mm. did you find that it changed you psychologically to be able to okay. read something to give you some strength? Definitely. Yeah. What What were the books yeah. that you found were the biggest uplifting and moments and what what were the early books that what, yeah. what gave you the idea that you could possibly do something i mean you mentioned obviously you were listening to the mm. one podcast but is can you sort of share any other experiences um i started watching videos on uh, trauma on how to heal from trauma i guess i had this like knowing <laughs> At some at some point in my life, I would have to work through the emotional trauma I'd been put through, and I just got so interested in this. And I remember reading um, <clears throat> the completion process by Teal Swan, um, and how you like if you feel your feelings, they actually go away, like you're clearing them out and. You, if you avoid feeling and remembering, then it will like you'll just carry it along with you, and it will like fester in you. And I was just like, this makes so much sense. And I, I when I was in bed, I was like, <clears throat> excuse me, trying to begin this internal healing process, but like it was too early because I was still being traumatized. So. Like, there's no point in trying to heal while, while you're still being stabbed, you know? Mm. <laughs> but, like, everything I learned about this, I've been doing now, after I've recovered. And it's, it has changed my life, and it's still changing my life. Mm. Mm. So, I kind of discovered meditation and what that can do for you. And I got, I slowly began changing my mindset into maybe maybe this is like yeah my life is like destroyed right now but maybe it's happening for a reason maybe it's happening for me it's maybe it's like a clearing so that new things can grow <laughs> mm -hmm. and it really has been that way mm. like and I started to look at symptoms like when I, this symptom is trying to tell me something. And when I re learn what that is, it will go away. And that is so true. Mm. <laughs> For like every everything I learned and realized, I started feeling better. <laughs> and yeah, like the body's my body was screaming at me and I started to like instead of going to the doctors and getting them to tell me what was going on with me I tried to like figure it out myself instead and like listen and look for lessons and messages mm. and that that really made it so much easier and i suddenly instead of feeling stuck i felt like i was on this journey mm. and yeah that really helped me to look at it that way because it's empowering yeah. once you are involved in the process it's empowering isn't it you're doing something and yeah. there will be some kind of change and that means yes. you have some power yeah so what were those things what were the things you realized what were the meanings of certain symptoms how did this what did you actually do i mean you did the meditation did the learning but what else did you actually do and how did that translate into a change in your symptoms what i actually did uh, on the physical level was ayurveda 
which yes. is the traditional health system of India. Mm-hmm. And I know that sounds really weird, but mm-hmm. uh, I had been like researching what what was going on in my stomach for a while. And when I heard about Ayurveda, I felt like I was someone knew the pieces I was missing, like this, <laughs> this is what I've been looking for all this time, like how they all these connections in your body and learning Ayurveda also made it so much easier to understand the symptoms. Like now I know that if I eat a lot of vinegar, then I will feel hot and get eczema. And so I was like beginning to look for these little connections. And I um, first heard about Ayurveda in like the spring of 2018. That was like one year before my recovery. And I thought I would have to go to India to get treatment. And that wasn't possible at all, Mm. (laughs) of course. And so I just, I read Idiot's Guide to Ayurveda really fast. I pushed through the headaches and everything because I just knew (laughs) there's something here. And I tried to like implement things here and there. But like what kind of things? um, Like um, not eating when you aren't hungry. Mm -hmm. Like they tell you like your digestion is kind of like um, a cooking pot and we cook in batches. So if the previous meal is being cooked right now and assimilated, don't put any fresh food on top of it that disturbs Mm. the last meal, (laughs) things like that. And when you take care of this digestive fire, it brings up your energy, it brings up your immunity. So just, and instead of eating cold or iced food drinks, that's like, like putting water ice cubes on a fire, you know, like, I started to drink like lukewarm water to help my digestion instead mm. of like cold water. Mm. That little things like that. And I began to notice that uh, eating very dry foods, which I was constantly eating, uh, bread, cereal, um, salads, uh, that increases the dryness. Like you take on the quality of the food that leads to constipation, bloating, dry skin. Mm. Um, so I've switched to eating more like cooked and warm and mushy foods. Mm-hmm. And that helped. <laughs> mm. But Quick, the fatigue... cooked foods, uh, because people talk a lot about this, <laughs> yeah. and you know, they have so many ideas and thoughts, and, and, and everyone disagrees when it comes to diet and what's good for you, right? <laughs> Yeah, and and one of the things I think that people have to recognize is that it's there isn't there isn't one answer here. Um, yeah, the answer that you really seek is what's good for you, as opposed to what's good yes. for everyone, and what's good for you right at this moment. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And that's what Ayurveda yeah. takes into account. It there is not there's no one diet. There is. Um, what state of balance or imbalance are you in right now? <laughs> mm. What What is your body type that is underlying in all of this? And what's, what's the season right now? And how is that affecting mm. our bodies? So right now it's fall and it's getting very dry and we are also getting dry. <laughs> so to counteract that Ayurveda recommends eating more like soups and stews in the fall Mm. to like not get so constipated and um, because I had like severe constipation when I was bed bound Mm. and this also leads to more anxiety (laughs) and nervous system symptoms because um, because it's the like gut you're, is you're, directly connected to the nervous yeah. system, right? Yeah. And you're like lacking fat and moisture and ins- insulation in your nervous system. It's it's so <laughs> it's so simple but so genius. 
but it was hard to see like i noticed like little changes like my skin became better but the fatigue was still like very strong but i actually found an ayurvedic practitioner in my city in the middle of nowhere norway <laughs> that had just moved here like two years ago and um she came to my house and on the first consultation, she told me, like, <laughs> not that long ago that she remembers that. And I was having trouble, like, sitting up and looking at her, like, my eyes, I couldn't, like, focus. I was just, like, swaying and my eyes were, like, blurry. Um, but she came to my house and together with this uh, Indian doctor, which we Skyped with, who is a doctor in Western medicine, and Ayurveda designed um, treatment for me. Mm -hmm. So, um, and what was that? So I, it's called a uh, Panchakarma. That means five actions in Sanskrit, um, and they have like five major um, treatments and tools to choose from, depending on the case. And the, so I didn't do all the five. I did like three and also uh, herbs and so I'll, yeah i'll start from the beginning um a panchakarma is a very gentle and mild kind of a cleanse um there might be a little bit of fasting in there but not like the fast we know in the west now when it's like five days like an Ayurvedic fast will look like more like two days of eating soup with spices. <laughs> like it's, it's gentle. So I did a lymph massage uh, with her herbal oils and sweating in steam. And the first two days I didn't sweat. <laughs> but after two days, I started sweating again. I hadn't in a long while. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was really out of balance. So, how did yes. you? Where did you go to sweat? Uh, they usually you go to the clinic and they have like this. Right. You first get the massage and then you sit yeah. in like this box. But she, we like improvised. So in my house, I was like sitting in a bathtub with a shower curtain, right. <laughs> and she had this steamer. So this work yeah and um, i also did um this this is gonna sound really weird but like herbalized oil enemas because yeah. i had such severe constipation for many years and also um herbalized oil of the sinuses <laughs> because in ayurveda they believe the sinuses are like the door to the brain and uh, so for like calming the nervous system and stuff. And also I was e eating for, for the duration of the treatment, I was eating only rice and lentils with spices, really easy to digest. Didn't give me any bloating or fatigue. I just felt so energized suddenly <laughs> after the meals because I could actually digest it. So literally only rice. Heavy. Only rice and lentils. Yes. Mm, okay. <laughs> with spices. Oh, yeah. At least it would taste of something <laughs> with the yes, spices. <laughs> like turmeric and lime and yes. cilantro. Yes. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> so, and so this was from the 21st of January 2019 to the 15th of February. 2019 and on like the 10th of February I was taking the bus <laughs> wow. to, I did the rest of the treatments at the clinic downtown after six weeks so I went after uh, 10 days <laughs> oh 10 I went days from bed bound to out in the world in like 10 days wow yes okay I thought you said sorry. I thought you said from from beginning of January. Did you say? Yes, it started in January and ended in February. 
Okay. Um, yeah. So it was si 16 days altogether. 16 days. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Of this treatment. And the It must have been sh like that must be so weird. Yeah, like my anxiety was through the roof uh being out in the world and all the people, all the noises, all the visual stimuli. But my energy was there. I mm. like I didn't have any muscles. I was super skinny and felt like see through. <laughs> but I didn't feel fatigued. So I had I actually got a little pain in my legs because I suddenly started walking so much mm. and I had to pace myself. Mm. So my energy was there, but my body hadn't like caught up. Mm. Yeah. And wow, this all comes really down to like dramatic. digestion. Mm. Yeah. So then, okay. So you, I mean, you're out of the house, but that's a long way from being healthy and normal again. So imagine the story mm. didn't end after 10 days. <laughs> <laughs> so no. tell me, where, where does it go from there? I mean, what what percentage functioning do you think you were? I mean, obviously, huge. Let's not mm -hmm. discount it. I mean, from yeah. bed bound <laughs> to being able to get on a bus, that's huge. So you're yeah. going virtually from 0%, right, functioning, 1% yeah. uh, functioning, whatever you want to call it, 5% functioning, to... Minus 20. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, minus 20, to maybe what, 20, 30% functioning? Is that what you would say? Yeah. Yeah. Like for 40 maybe. I yeah. like I wasn't like working or anything, but I was seeing friends and I was cooking more. Yeah. Yeah. And Living then, life. <laughs> and then so what 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 did you do then? You'd mentioned meditation. Um, Had you already been doing the meditation at this stage? Yes, but it was really hard being in that panicky bedbound state. So I wouldn't say I was like uh, going into deep meditative states. So I mostly did like guided meditations on YouTube, like listening to them because it did help me relax a little. Yeah. So yeah, after I was suddenly catapulted into the world again, uh, I started this rejuvenation and rebuild rebuilding phase in Ayurveda. So I was taking uh, herbs for, uh, I don't know, six months to help me gain weight, um, just support, build the rebuild in my body after having indigestion for so long. Um, because like nothing works when you don't digest. <laughs> so and was eating like uh, ghee, like clarified butter and yeah, just trying to gain weight and uh, what was your rebuild diet like? I mean, muscles. After the mm. rice and lentils, where do you go from there? I actually kept eating that for a while because I, I was so scared that I would go back if I ate something else. So looking back i ate that for too long and it yeah it made me a little skinny <laughs> but um I, I began like living more ayurvedically like i do eat meat now and um like pretty normal food but it's i know i can digest it now i eat it when i'm truly hungry like i know that i can like handle it and i don't eat like heavy foods late at night when the digestive fire is like lower mm. so i would say n i i also always eat like the heaviest meal for lunch because that's when the mm. fire is the strongest and that's where you kind of need the energy the most as well so I would say I eat, ate like dinner foods for lunch and mm. I still do. And often more like uh, vegetarian food for dinner. Mm -hmm. It's kind of what I try to do. <laughs> but, yeah. but, but I see where you're now and I saw, see where you're there, but I'm curious, how did you transition? Like I said, I mean, rice and lentils and now you're eating 
as you describe, a balanced diet yeah. of all kinds of foods and, you know, mindful about when you eat it and all this, but presumably eating vegetables, meats, all kinds of foods now. Yeah. Fruits. But, uh, yeah. Fruits, but how, yeah. How, how, did you, how did you go from rice and lentils to a normal diet, in essence? Um, well, normal is a strong word. I mean, there's a lot of normal <laughs> out there that's really not normal, but you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> a range of foods. Like I, I had learned that um, bloating and pain often came from um, undercooked food, basically too raw, too hard to digest. So I began eating like cooked fruits before I ate the fruits. Mm -hmm. And I, I yeah, my food is mostly. Were these low fodmap, <laughs> low fodmap foods that you were eating at first? So no, when you, when you transition, I, I'm, I'm I'm kind of curious. Like, what's your <laughs> first meal? You eat rice and lentils. What's the first thing you eat, and then what do you eat after that? And it's obviously a little I, while ago. Yeah. So if I'm asking you <laughs> too, too specific, that's okay. But there's people who were like curious, you know. Mm. I think I began with like soups and like porridge and stuff okay. like cooked, wet, warm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So soups with and vegetables. I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or like sweet potato soup or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I just I just started trying things, and I noticed that when I did eat a salad, I did get bloating again. But if if the salad was more like more cooked, there's like grains in it and not just like raw vegetables, then it's fine. Then I don't get bloating. So it's like those little adjustments that you mm. kind of learn with Ayurveda. And I also could, since my I was more in balance and more in line with my body type, I could begin like eating for that body type. And I'm kind of like the fire body type it's called pitta and i easily get like oily red skin um acid reflux and i don't i don't feel well in the sun so that's a body type <laughs> and so i do best with uh reducing spices and vinegar and ketchup and all those things and eating like a lot of vegetables and grains and sweet fruits and mm -hmm. yeah I'm like and I notice I can tell how much better my skin is on mm. this this pitta pacifying diet mm. it's called. And, and these are the foods I, if yeah. you think about it that your ancestors would have been eating right in Norway yeah <laughs> right if we go so back even yeah. just not long. I mean, I'm not talking about like 5,000 years, but even if we go back 500 years, right? Yeah. So even very recently, I mean, this is, you know, I don't think that we're eating spicy curries. No. With vinegar <laughs> chips, you yeah. know? <laughs> exactly. And I've really been like going back to more the traditional way of eating in Norway because I'm built for milk and vegetables and grains like mm. and that's when i feel my best and my skin mm. is the best so, so i just uh <laughs> well, I, I just people should really listen out here what you're saying uh, i i think the real message here is what's best for you what's best for vera right because i'm telling you there'd yeah. be like thousands and thousands of people who would have just about fell off the chair when you mentioned milk as being good for you you know what i mean and, and yeah. <laughs> see, it, you know, opinions are lovely. We all mm -hmm. have opinions, but facts are what count. And if those foods help you, then anyone else's opinion, who cares? <laughs> do, 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 do you know what I mean? And, and I think yeah. there's, there is a great power in experimenting and listening to seeing what happens. Yes. And that's what I love about Ayurveda, that it kind of gives you this, if you're not like used to listening to these subtle uh, signals from your body, they give you like a br blueprint to follow first, and then you, it kind of, you take over and do it yourself. 
Right. Because I've always had this instinct that I, I don't like ketchup. I don't like sour things. They makes my skin itch. Like, <laughs> and now it's like, oh, that's why. <laughs> and yeah, and there's no like milk is bad. Uh, wheat is bad. It's more like milk is good for this body type taken in this way in this season. Mm. <laughs> Wheat is good for this body type, and maybe not so much for this one. So it's mm. there's no one diet. It's supposed to like tailor this mm. um, individualized diet for you. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. So okay, you're making progress. You're eating more and more normal food, and presumably symptoms are abating. Your fatigue and and other symptoms. Uh, I mean, what about the stimulus, neurological symptoms? And what about the weird walking symptoms, the leg straightening symptoms, the hands? Oh, yeah. What about, um, you know, I mean, there's so many symptoms, right? I mean, how did the symptoms mm -hmm. peter off over what time? And, and what else did you do? Okay, so the fatigue, I would say, disappeared in that February 2019. And the neurological, yeah, yeah, the fatigue was gone. But the, the neurological symptoms came and went. And that's when I started to see the, the pattern that um, they only came <laughs> when I was around my parents, when I was stress, stressed or scared. Mm. So, yeah. I began to notice that that's the only times I had headaches and I could sometimes lose feeling in my hands and feet when I was around them because I was like extremely walking on eggshells, very scared. Um, and so in like June uh, 2019, I, I finally uh, cut contact with them unfortunately but but, but how I, I mean you were yeah. living with them i mean so what you just moved yeah. out yeah i mean that like, can't be easy i, I mean financially yeah. you know I, I suppose i mean are you working i mean how did you do mm. this uh, i was getting um a sum of money every month from uh, the government and for like being out of work and being sick uh, and since i had basically only been in bed i had saved up uh, a lot of this <laughs> and but i w i was terrified and i didn't feel ready to move at all but i just suddenly this one morning i couldn't take it anymore and i just realized like my head felt so much clearer as well <laughs> and i just suddenly realized okay i have to deal with this like because they aren't changing they won't treat me any better i've tried a million times to like uh advocate for better treatment you know and they won't listen they won't change and it's time to um set some boundaries here or I just broke down one morning and, and I just started crying and I packed some things, put it on my bike and I biked away. Like seriously, it, it was like in a movie or something. And where did you go? I went to my uh, sibling first uh -huh. and then I found an apartment like one and a half weeks later, which I, I rent. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so it was. It was definitely not like a smooth transition, but it was overdue and necessary. Yeah. That's me giving you a high five here through the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh. Awesome. So I, I mean, re um, I realized, you know, yeah. <laughs> because we're so vulnerable, uh, because I would imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but. Your, I would imagine that your self-confidence and your self-esteem 
uh, is so low <laughs> that you don't even know yeah. what those words mean. <laughs> no. <laughs> at this stage. And, and to take something upon yourself, like trying to stand on your own two feet when not so long ago you literally couldn't stand on your own two feet. Yeah. I Just mean, like you know, three it, months earlier, <laughs> you know, uh, regardless of the unhealthy dynamic in, in the home, there were people feeding you, you know, I mean, yes. what are you thinking going out on your own? I mean, have you got a backup plan or are you feeling very confident that you're not going to go back to that physical state? Are you not scared? Hmm. I felt pretty safe that since I was now living Ayurvedically and eating this way that I was pretty safe in my health. Even though the stress was insane, I knew I wouldn't like go back to that level again because yeah, I, ha I couldn't, uh, how do I explain this? I couldn't uh, reach that level of indigestion again with the things I knew now. Mm -hmm. So, and I knew that that indigestion led to that level of fatigue. So it's like, mm. okay, I know I won't get that sick at least, <laughs> mm. Mm. but yeah, I had no plan. I had no confidence and I, I was mm. scared to death, but mm. I, I had to, I couldn't stay because I knew I would get sick again, like gradually deteriorate again. Mm. And I just like done took so much for my yeah. body. Yeah. yeah. All that work, you couldn't let it go to waste. So you took the leap. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, <laughs> let me just take a side path for a moment. You know, the symptoms are physically hard to deal with, right? And that mm -hmm. thing when we are struggling to take in the stimulation and mm. you can feel a stress in your body the electricity and all of this is going on and yeah. you know all these things and you know that when you are getting the stimulation how it's going to make it even worse and then you can deal with it even less right yeah so we get pretty scared of our symptoms we get scared of the stimulation we get scared of everything yeah And you take this and you have this dramatic improvement after these, these 10 days. Um, was all the fear gone at that stage? Did you feel different <laughs> about your symptoms? I mean, tell me how that journey progressed at, at what stage and what are you thinking? Are you doing anything mentally or emotionally? I, yeah, I was scared to death of stimulus still. Uh, it made me very anxious to like go outside and meet people and talk. I was like scared to like talk to friends for like two hours. But uh, it was kind of like exposure therapy. You you do it and you f it triggers you, but then you see that you, okay, you survive and then it gets mm. a little bit easier the next time and until you feel relaxed while doing it. But what about if it wasn't okay? Yeah. What about if you got triggered and you felt it and then you felt worse the next day? Well, what's going on? What are you thinking now? What are you doing? <sighs> yeah, I was very afraid that I would get this like crashes and like I would have to like pay for energy spent and and getting so triggered by stimuli that I would get so anxious that I would feel pain. But I did still feel some of those things that I got so anxious that my whole body was like so tense that it was painful the next day because I had been so mm -hmm. tense. But I just I was just in pure survival mode at, at this point and I was just getting through the day and I woke up the next morning and I could function and I could cook and I could do it. And it just, it was a very like gradual expansion of uh, my life, what I could do. And I, I was scared to death for every expansion. 
like going to the grocery store and I was like shaking, but I guess I kind of just accepted being anxious and did it anyway. And mm, yeah, exposure therapy mm. does work. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I really appreciate what you're saying. I understand what, what you're going through and I've seen this many times. Um, but I want to take you to the moment where things are not going well. You know, when you moved out or and you did something mm. and it was too much and you're having a setback. I mean, what are you thinking? Oh my mm. God, it's all going to come back now? Yeah. And And how do you deal with that? And what about the symptoms? The symptoms are coming up. What, what are you doing? You're noticing the symptoms. How did you react? Yeah. Uh, I felt like I was on very like shaky ground <laughs> at this time. And sometimes I got so anxious that I passed out. <laughs> like the, the time after I moved out, I remember I like blacked out uh, once a day or something for a few weeks. It was extreme times, <laughs> but I had learned a lot of meditation and stuff at this point, point. So I was just like, okay, I'm going to sit down and breathe <laughs> until I feel better. And it was, hmm. I was just letting all the feelings come and I journaled like crazy. I mm. journaled until my hand like cramped up. I was like it was like this flood of um repressed emotions was coming up and i knew i had to feel it and release it and so i just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and mm -hmm. just tried to not escape the mm -hmm. fear and the pain yeah so tell me <laughs> I don't about know the... if that answered the question yeah yeah it's great i mean tell me about the journaling what does that mean because uh, you know, mm. there's different things, isn't it? I mean, we can habituate an emotion. Oh, I'm always feeling scared. So I just people can just feel scared forever. They're always feeling anxious or they're always worried or whatever the emotion is. And there's something, mm. there's a need for us to break that habit, that behavior. But at the same point, and you alluded to this earlier, it's not healthy to suppress emotions. Because if they're suppressed, they just mm -hmm. confess them, they just keep coming up. <laughs> so we've got to feel them, we've got to let them out, but we don't want to make a sport out of it. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so, you know, uh, it's interesting, you're letting yourself feeling the emotions and you're saying, okay, well, this is how it is right now. There's this bad stuff going on and I'm feeling the emotions and you're accepting it, right? That was the word you used, acceptance. I think you said acceptance. Maybe I just interpreted yeah. it that way. I tried to, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but then, because you said, I think this is how it is, you know? And, but then the journaling, what what are you doing? How are you journaling? What does that mean, that word journaling? And and how does, uh, how does it change yeah. how you look mm -hmm. at things? It means um, just... It's more like raw journaling. Just give the feeling a voice. Like, just write, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> I'm going to die. Um, what if this happens? Like, just, it does, I don't write to like get, um, I don't write an essay. I just, it's like a stream, mm. stream of consciousness. Just so instead of just having the thoughts, mm. we're putting those very words that are going through our mind onto paper, right? Yeah. And that kind of, releases them and then you look at them and it's easier to see that maybe this isn't fully true like every time i write down fear i'm like hmm, yeah <laughs> is is it really that bad will this really happen <laughs> so mm. yeah and also uh i've also heard this from other that after doing that punch of karma all these repressed memories come up and feelings because the body is like so has been like reset and it's so clean and your mind is clear and so that's when you begin like an even deeper cleanse <laughs> mm. so i was just uh, writing down everything like traumas that i had repressed 
and it was so validating to see it on paper. Mm. Like, uh, did it make like, you look at the it... experience differently? Because obviously, when you're going through it in your head and you're remembering it through the eyes, perhaps even of a younger person, when you're getting the trauma, or more recently, oh, yeah. you're looking through your own eyes in your head, right? Now you're writing yeah. it in a journal. Now you're looking at what you said, or saw, or felt. How did you change? How did that change your experience of that trauma? Oh, completely changed it. But it worked even if I wasn't writing it down. But if if I just went back into the memory instead of like, no, I don't want to think about that. You, when I like re-examined it as an adult, it released so much shame and blame that I had taken upon myself because <laughs> as kids we like take on the blame for everything mm. because no one else is taking it so you kind of have to <laughs> and i could like see the situation from with like fresh eyes and it was so healing and i let the emotions come up and mm. yeah i can like remember the same things now but there's no emotional charge attached to the memory mm. like the memory has just become a memory instead of like trauma because it has been processed because mm. it has so a different it's... meaning now yeah right. it's a different because perspective we meaning yeah it's a different yeah. perspective because before the perspective is you're in there, this is happening and you're feeling these things and you're blaming yourself maybe or taking responsibility yeah. or whatever. Now you relive it, you let out the emotion, you maybe even write it down and you look at it and you go, Yeah. Hey, this isn't my fault. <laughs> yeah. This actually had nothing to do with me. Yeah. <laughs> because we do assign meaning like uh meanings i like and meanings become beliefs about yourself like i used to believe i always say the wrong things everything i say is stupid my laugh is stupid like i always do and say the wrong things i can't trust myself mm. or my instincts but when i look at it in a new way it it's like no it, I didn't say anything wrong. I was just being myself. <laughs> I was just being a child. It didn't have anything to do with me. It had everything to do with the adult mm. Mm. or the other children in the or peers or something. They they were just projecting their inner inner struggles onto me. I was mm. just there. <laughs> yeah. Listen, uh, everything you say makes awesome sense, but. How does somebody go from not knowing about any of this to suddenly knowing this truth and using it to transform themselves? I mean, who were your mentors? Who were your teachers? Hmm. Where did you well where did you learn this? How can someone follow in your footsteps with this wisdom that hmm. you're sharing here? Hmm. I'm, yeah, I'm trying to like condense it <laughs> to something like easy. Because it's not, it's not one mm -hmm. book, is it? It's not one podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's, but I would say the completion process book by Teal Swan, it was like the foundation. Mm -hmm. And then I've like developed my own methods and just, just, journaled and yeah kept did, doing it and realized what worked and yeah did, did you did you get some help with journaling did you come across how that can be used or did no. you just <laughs> it was just your own process that developed yeah oh, okay right. yeah or I, I think I've kind of based it on um um if you've heard the term uh morning pages 
like when you just wake up in the morning and you just write down whatever is on your mind and if you don't know what to write you just write i don't know what to write i don't know what to write and then suddenly something comes up comes up it is like that just mm. whatever comes up if i have a difficult emotion i just write um i try to like describe it where it is i feel this pressure here and here Mm. And then suddenly a memory comes up and then I write what, like, there's no method. It's just write what I think and feel. <laughs> mm. Mm. And like an instinct, follow your instinct. Yeah. Maybe not so and cerebral, it, maybe more just letting go of the control of the process. Yeah. Huh? Let the process you're trying lead you. To, yeah, you're tr like trying to release and let let it like flow out of you mm. kind of mm. yeah and not like analyze so much just right you can analyze after you've done the release mm. or you often have realizations as you do this mm. like maybe you realize oh that's why i used to love singing but now i can't and i think it's stupid because this memory <laughs> like it, it it comes up mm. naturally so yeah, mm. just just right. <laughs> so you're doing <laughs> these you're doing these amazing things, and you're healing from the trauma, and you're building your own life. I mean, how long does yeah. it take for you? <laughs> once you moved out, you moved out what three months after you, you had your uh, your first treatments? Is that right? Yeah, like two and a half. <laughs> two and a half months. And then you're doing this work on your own, this trauma, you're trying to reintegrate, pacing yeah. yourself as you in integrate yourself in society and shopping and f people yeah. and all of this. And you're doing this trauma work on your own. Uh, are you, yeah. and you're still working with uh, a practitioner? Yes? Uh, yeah. Yeah, a but, little bit? Uh, not not so much not at so much. this time because, yeah. And then so but we're still like keeping in touch. Mm -hmm. So how long does it take until you like fully well? And and did you do anything else along the way? Uh, I started uh, taking um, extra shifts in like June uh, at my old job, <laughs> um, and I worked like two, three days a week until November where I got um, hired. Um, I work seven, I work a 70% job mm. now. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, while I'm in my free time, I'm like trying to build up my YouTube channel and stuff. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you're working full time in essence. Yeah. Like more than full time. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, and, it gives me energy. The other yeah. thing. Yeah. So it took about what about a year to fully recover. Would you say? I'd say longer. like six six months, maybe. Six months. Yeah. Yeah, because I was like feeling strong, but I was having a lot of anxiety and <clears throat> excuse me, yeah. uh, healing from um, complex PTSD, which which I'm still doing. But I don't really count that fully as part of the chronic fatigue uh, right. recovery. So you're saying sort of six months for the symptoms to abate, but you're still dealing with anxiety and the PTSD. And then, yeah. Yeah. And so how long was it then until most of that was resolved? I mean, obviously, maybe you're still dealing with it somewhat now, but would you say yeah. in total it was... 12 months, 18 months? Mm, until I felt like a, a lot better, do you mean? Yes. Or with the with the trauma and the anxiety. With the trauma, yeah. Yeah, I would say like a year. Then. A year, yeah. Like this spring I started feeling like better. <laughs> yeah. yeah, cool. And, and that's when I began... That's when I uploaded my first video mm. as well. Do you think yeah. that by at this stage that your physical well-being had still continued to improve? Like you said, six months to recover, but I'm thinking between six months and 12 months, physically that 
there was still a bigger improvement? Yeah, and I feel like there's still physical improvement coming. Mm. But but I'm I was like fully functioning in like last yeah. fall. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But so there's a difference I, between I, not yeah. being sick mm -hmm. and being fully vital, yeah. isn't there? Yeah, yeah. So we get out of being sick, but we still continue to improve. And you know, many people tell me that they end up being like 120% recovered, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because they go, I'm yeah. fully recovered, but then later they feel even better. Okay. So mm. yeah, I'm still like getting better, I'd say, because yeah. the more emotions I release and the less anxiety I have, the better, even better my digestion becomes and yes. the more energy I have to like, uh, enjoy life because like complex PTSD, like it is exhausting. <laughs> so, and it takes up a lot of time, like being anxious, you mm. it, like somehow you two hours have gone by and you're like, where did they go? And you've just been anxious. You know? Mm, mm, so mm. yeah, I feel like my life is still like expanding and blossoming. Yes. So, yeah. Awesome. And um, <laughs> so, in terms of the physical recovery, uh, was there anything in addition to the Ayurveda, or was that was there anything else that you did? Uh, you know. No, th that was what I did. Which okay. Were. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then for the anxiety and PTSD, you mentioned the journaling and expressing the emotions. Was there anything else? Yeah. And the meditation? Yes. Yeah. Was there anything else um, that you did? Did you get any help from a therapist or anything like that? Yeah, I did. Um, in like from October 2019. But I feel like what has worked the most is the things I've done for myself. So the releasing the emotions and just feeling the triggers and, but what I learned, the, the most important thing I learned from the therapist was, um, avoidance is upkeeping of PTSD. If you, so she was, we were very like, uh, aligned with our philosophies, like, if you avoid the feelings, if you avoid triggering situations, you will continue to have the anxiety. So she like really pushed me to mm. uh, go to grocery stores that I was afraid of going to because mm. I didn't want to meet my parents, etc. <laughs> you like you have to go there and take the risk and feel the anxiety and stay there until you feel better. And it works. I can like move around the city as I want now. I don't, I'm not like afraid mm. <laughs> or as much as I used to be. Yeah. You know, obviously that's an awesome, inspiring uh, story, you know, and I think I, I hope people are really listening to what it's yeah. like when you're unsupported because so many people go, yeah, I could do this if I was only supported. But I don't have the support, yeah. like, I don't have the magic husband or the magic parents or blah, blah, blah. Mm. And, 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 you know, so often I see people with and without these resources. And, and many people have told me with the resources, yes, that have really helped me, that made it so much easier. I don't know how I could have done it without them. Mm. But the more people I speak to, I can't help but wonder if it's, at the end of the day, when, when it comes to the crunch, the buck stops with you, you know, yeah. the buck stops with you and you are the person that's at the central of all of this. And whilst that yeah. makes it really difficult, it also gives you the power. Yeah. It's a lot of responsibility and it's overwhelming, but it's also liberating and you are the captain of your own ship and yeah. your health ship. Yeah. Like if you had the best doctor in the world, they would still be like a um, side character <laughs> in yeah. the movie. And uh, when you claw your way out of a situation like this, basically on your own, 
you build a true confidence and that's why I think I've been able to handle all these uh, personal attacks and gaslighting from family members and stuff yeah. because I've built this I know I can trust myself I know I can do things and I can trust my instincts and my intuition now and if I feel like your behavior is wrong then I will set boundaries against mm. you like it's, I I just feel like I am in myself now and yes yeah <laughs> Because, you know, we all have different voices in our head. We all have the voice of fear, the voice of doubt, the, the voice of uncertainty about ourselves. Maybe I am this, maybe I am that, maybe they're right, maybe... Or you yeah. can... And you <laughs> see people sometimes who are very confident in life and... We might even say they're wrong. <laughs> that they're delusional. <laughs> And, and what I would go to say is that in a way, we're all delusional, right? Because our mm. reality is something that we experience on the inside. It's not really about the facts always, yes? I mean, of course, there's some yeah. of this, you know, I'm not trying to discount your um, experience and the facts that you, of your experience. But, but as an example, I can pretty much guarantee you that your parents see that whole way that interaction between you and them completely different yes yeah and and so yeah when we go through all of this we have to listen to that voice that serves us yeah <laughs> isn't it that's really what it's about it's a choice isn't it yeah and i've actually worked a lot on um sorting through like the voices in my head that sounds like <laughs> crazy but we, we all have them like and they come from our parents teachers society a lot of different voices and i've had i've worked really hard this past year on finding which one is mine and which one is like trauma and like the journaling has like really strengthened my own voice and I also check in with my body now and see how I feel because the gut feeling is um, a lot more trustworthy than the thoughts and analyzing your way to an because answer. Because you don't know which voice that is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so is like it? using the gut feeling to your mm. advantages. Mm. And just if you're like analyzing a, re a relationship, like but. But yeah, we've known each other for so long and uh, yada, yada, yada. And, but if you like, listen, how do you feel when you think about that person? And if that is not good, then yeah, that's your answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. The instinct, and you know, instinct is so I, powerful. And dare I say a woman's instinct is even more powerful. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. That, that, those are those are really wise words. But you know, it is. Yeah, it's. You know, uh, we think sometimes we we try to think our way out of it, don't we? Out of these problems and yeah, and and so many people who have these challenges become the experts at all of this. They know about everything, but it's not about knowing or analyzing. It's about doing and yeah <laughs> you know and i think uh, i really love how you tell that in your story about the persistence you must be really persistent with feeling the emotion facing your fears writing yeah. it down interpreting it <laughs> rethinking it i mean yeah. that's tough work but here's the thing what is the alternative yeah staying stuck <laughs> staying, staying stuck. in pain like it's hard work, but it's harder to not do it. It yeah. truly is. Yeah. And can I just mention one more thing? Please. Our books that really are also part of the foundation here in my story. It was actually like decluttering and doing like the, the KonMari, <clears throat> if you heard about that, the Japanese mm. decluttering method. 
when when you're like supposed to hold something in your hands and connect to how you feel about it and that's how you make the decisions when i first did that that was before i became bed bound and that really planted a seed that has grown and so i would say this is foundational in my recovery and in my life change and transformation mm. because that's the first time i realized that like whoa i have no idea what i'm feeling i don't know how to make my own decisions and i'm just so disconnected to myself and so confused and so decluttering was really like a practice in connecting to myself mm -hmm. and i felt like i had no identity and uh, not with outside things like style and i don't know what i like i just wear whatever keeps me the safest like less criticized you know <laughs> so and through decluttering i i could really like see a pattern like oh this is my style <laughs> and it just just made me feel so much more connected to myself so i did like decluttering before i was bed bound and it led me to the internal decluttering as well mm, yeah and questioning everything and like does this hobby spark joy no it feels like um obligation <laughs> mm. struggle like i really began to connect to what i actually feel and that is how you build a happy life <laughs> by doing things that make you feel happy mm. so, yeah it's about learning to trust yourself in your own opinions and and yes yeah yeah um yeah what an awesome method to tap into gaining confidence isn't it it's really about gaining confidence yeah. who, who who am i and what do i think yeah. and if you can listen to it about a weird little statue that you have whether you should toss it or mm. keep it well it's like a decision making muscle and every time you enact yes. it you kind of go okay building well, building it appears i have a voice yes <laughs> i have a voice and when you yeah and when you clear out everything that isn't you mm. you are left with you and you can see yourself so much more clearly yeah. who you are what you like what you want and, and suddenly, in that space you have cleared out yeah. which is probably time and space in your house <laughs> fill it with something that truly sparks joy yeah yes. <laughs> thank you for sharing uh Vera. that is <laughs> such an awesome uh, uh experience and and story so let me ask you i'll ask you two things the first thing is what does the future hold for Vera? Oh. <laughs> well, long term, my dream is to be an Ayurvedic practitioner, mm -hmm. which I've, yeah, I forgot to say that this past year, I have studied Ayurveda on the weekends. So I am finished with my first year, <laughs> but wow. I have like three, three more left. Thank you. So that's my long term dream. Mm -hmm. And before that, I would love to coach uh, recovery from psychological abuse and like building up your identity and like finding who you are and strengthening your inner voice. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I'm working on now. Fantastic. And I would love to write books and make um, like workbooks with journaling prompts that mm -hmm. kind of take it through the process that I've been through. Mm. Yeah, Fantastic. that's my dream. And I would also love to get a cat. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you place those two things together. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your, your awesome, inspiring story and, um, and uh, we'll make sure we put a link underneath so people can find your YouTube channel uh, and your website. And uh, 
Uh, I wish you all the best with, uh, with your studies and your new life. Thank you so much for having me and yeah. yes, I wish sending everyone who watches this so much love, hope, <laughs> strength, inspiration and just remember that uh, there are very like tiny answers along the way that build like a snowball. <laughs> just Absolutely. plant good seeds and give it time. Yeah. Follow your instinct. Such wise words. Thank you very much, Rio. Thank you so much. <laughs>